Welcome to the Picture This Photography Podcast, where we talk about all things photography, and we have a new episode just about every week, and it's free. And if you want to help us out, you can go to your favorite podcasting app and leave us a review. We read every single one. And if you have a suggestion for a theme or a topic for the show, you can leave it in your review, and we'll look at that. Uh, And today, our topic of discussion is photography urban legends. I'm constantly getting comments from people who have some outdated idea, like they can't deplete their batteries to 100% or they can't delete pictures in camera. And I've traced some of these back to their crazy origin. So we're going to kind of talk about that. Yeah. And I have this this deep feeling that you're going to cause some violent nerd controversy, Tony. That does That's your favorite thing to do, I believe. I do kind of love it. Let's talk about our sponsor, Squarespace. First. Let's take a moment to thank Squarespace for making this podcast possible. And you know what else they can make possible? They can make you a beautiful, professional-looking website for very little money that takes very little time to build. And you can get a free trial for 14 days. So go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea and use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. So the number, we're going to, it's not like the numbers matter. They're not more important, but. You know, number one, fully discharge your battery. This myth is actually rooted in some past truths, which I think a lot of these myths are. Yes. In the past, rechargeable batteries were based on technologies that are now outdated, like nickel metal hydride. And these batteries had what they called a memory effect, where if you discharged your battery to 50% every time you used it, eventually the battery would actually die once you got to 50%. But we don't really use that anymore, and it's certainly not in any modern camera rechargeable batteries. Nowadays, we moved on to a new technology, lithium ion, which they write Li ion, and that's the battery technology behind just about everything, from your smartphone to our electric car, and the effect, it still has an effect depending on whether or not you fully discharge it or not. But now it works the opposite, whereas with the older technologies, you were supposed to fully discharge the battery to avoid the memory effect. With lithium ion, if you do fully discharge it, you actually kind of shatter some of the crystals in there that store the energy. And thus, every time you fully discharge it, you actually permanently lose some amount of capacity. That explains why our daughter's phone battery dies so much more quickly than ours. Yes, because she is always running that thing on the line at like 1%. And if you do that, if you are using your lithium ion batteries constantly at the lowest end, then they will lose their life really, really quickly. Sometimes we have, in some capacities, we have more intelligent lithium ion battery management, like our electric car doesn't charge to 100%, because if you charge it to 100% every day, you would lose capacity, like total capacity over time. And you're not supposed to deplete it to 0% unless there's some kind of emergency. So if you keep it charged in the middle, lithium ion batteries can have a really long lifetime, like more than a decade. But if you're like most people with their smartphones, you charge it to 100% and then deplete it to 0%. And that's why six months after you bought your smartphone, it seems to have no battery life left. Why are batteries so temperamental? Why are they so difficult? The technology just isn't great. Anyway, long story short, you can just charge your battery all the time. It's probably the best thing just to keep your camera on a charger, but definitely don't worry about the memory effect. It's not a problem with any modern camera. Our second myth slash urban legend, don't delete pictures in camera. And I've heard people get so upset about this one. They say, "Ugh, you went through your photos and you deleted them while you were looking. You're going to corrupt your memory card. Tony. Why do people think this? The best I can find is that one of the first consumer digital cameras had buggy software. And if you deleted pictures in the camera, that buggy software would mess up what's called the file allocation table, the FAT, on the SD card. And the entire SD card could become corrupted. But that hasn't happened in any other camera that I can find. And certainly no camera made in like the last decade has exhibited this bug. Like it's a pretty horrendous bug to corrupt the entire memory card just because you deleted a picture. Your camera is not doing anything to the SD card that your computer wouldn't do when you deleted pictures. And in fact, deleting a picture is a much simpler operation than adding a new picture. When you delete a picture, it's just like the camera goes into the table of contents of a book and marks out that one line. 
that's all it's doing. There's no reason the entire card should become corrupted. And my own firsthand experience is we have deleted pictures in camera thousands of times because we'd like to kind of thin out the pictures before we get to the computer. So if you have a set of pictures and none of them worked, we'll just delete that entire group of photos. So we have left less to sort through later. And it doesn't cause any problems. This is just an old urban legend that was once true, passed down in the lore of graybeard photographers who once had this old camera that had this problem and now they just tell the younger generation, whoa, don't do this, but it's just not true. It makes sense. You can sense. delete pictures. It makes sense that these traumatic stories would be passed down. And when people have fear about something and they don't understand it, then they just kind of like, whoa, don't take the risk. Just don't do it. Yeah, but there does come a time when you can just ignore the forefathers and go with something Bye, more forefathers. modern. forefathers. I'm doing it my way. Number three, UV filters improve image quality. I think this one's interesting because it's also rooted in something very real, something that people had to worry about, but it's not a problem anymore and we're still holding on to that fear that we might need a UV filter. Yeah, so first, if you don't know what UV is, that's ultraviolet. And it's some light that's just very slightly outside the range of the visible light that us humans can see. Some animals can see ultraviolet light, and it turns out some really old film could pick up ultraviolet light. And thus, these UV filters, you would put this filter on the front of your lens, and it would block this these wavelengths that our eyes could not see. And because the film was also sensitive to it, it would improve the color. It would make it less bluish because it would be like the blue parts of the film that would be reacting to this ultraviolet light. And in those ways, the UV filters would improve the image quality. Corollary to this, camera stores love selling UV filters because they make some money off of it. So it was kind of in their favor to perpetuate this outdated myth. But even with more modern films, they eliminated this sensitivity to UV light. And then with digital cameras, digital sensors have filters over them that block infrared and UV. And there's just no need to stack an additional filter on the outside of your lens for the purpose of image quality. Some people might want to do it if they're at the beach and they want to make sure that like, the front element doesn't get sand on it or something like that. But for image quality, forget it. Unless you're shooting with very outdated film, which you're not, there's no reason for it. You don't know what they do in their free time. <laughs> <laughs> Number four on our list of myths, higher megapixels equals more noise. Now we've actually tested this one. So we can speak personally to our results. Yeah, we've tested it, but we've also had our own real-world experience. And for example, when we first got our Nikon D810, it was a 36 megapixel camera. And at the time, we were like, whoa, it's so many megapixels. It's too many? Who knows? <laughs> and about the same time, the Sony a7S came out, and it was a 12 megapixel camera. And I heard this over and over again so much that I totally believed it, but I believed the 12 megapixel camera would have would produce much cleaner low light images than the 36 megapixel camera would. And so when we went and shot a concert and it was of course very low light as concerts it was like a rock concert and you shot the Nikon and I shot the Sony and my Sony pictures looked so much worse with the same camera settings so much worse than the high resolution D810. And I was like, this has gone against everything that I've been taught. Were you shooketh? I was. The high <laughs> resolution sensor had much cleaner images at high ISO than the low res sensor. And so we went and we did some just more objective testing. And yeah, to at least my human eye, the D, the high resolution camera always looked better. And this has been repeated over and over again. For example, if you look at DxO Mark, which tests sensors, and you compare the 24 megapixel Nikon D750 to the 45 megapixel Nikon D850, and you go into their measurements and you look at the signal to noise ratio, the signal to noise ratio from low ISO to high ISO is virtually indistinguishable. They, they have the same noise measured objectively, but also measured subjectively by looking at it with our eyes. And in fact, I would argue that the higher resolution image sensor always produces better pictures because in my real world experience with these higher resolution sensors, you get more data and thus you can crank up the noise reduction a little and the noise reduction trades some of that detail for cleaner image quality. And I always find that the high resolution sensor, even in high ISOs, produces 
cleaner, better looking images overall. And this is a big deal to people. A lot of people went out and bought low resolution cameras like the Sony a7S series, or they prefer 24 megapixel cameras over 36 megapixel cameras because they think it's lower noise. They spend thousands of dollars based on what I think is a false urban legend. I trace part of this back. I always like to figure out like, where does this Where'd idea come, come from? from? Yeah. If it doesn't hold up in the real world, I trace part of this back again to DxOMark. DxOMark assigns a score for the noise of most new cameras. And when the Sony a7S came out, this 12 megapixel, low megapixel camera, they assigned it a score of 3,702, which is a very high score. It means it should be like amazing in low light. And then the 45 megapixel D850 got a score of 2,660, which is substantially lower. That should be a big difference. Um, but I don't know why that was. Like, I don't agree with a lot of DxO mark measurements because they don't necessarily match up with what I've seen in the real world. But nothing has been more striking to me than what seems like a huge difference actually ends up being opposite in our real world experience where the D850 images always look better even at high ISOs. And even if you look at the DxO mark chart as opposed to those summary measurements, the lines are very, very close together. I think mm -hmm. something just went wrong with their initial testing of the A7S because even when Sony's A7S Mark II came out, it had the exact same sensor, they ended up giving it a much lower score, a much lower and much more realistic score. So, Oh, interesting. I think the roots of this are possibly in a mismeasurement of the Sony A7S or in some weirdness around how they calculate their summary score, but it doesn't at all match up with our real world testing, which we have tested over and over again <laughs> to try to validate it. That was interesting for me because you used the Mark to validate your opinion and then to invalidate it. So, well, it's the DXO Mark <laughs> summary score that I yeah. think is misleading. I think their actual measurements look pretty realistic, but again, they're not measuring what the human eye sees. They're actually like counting data, which, yeah. Our number five myth. How many myths are there? You're asking. 13. Too many, and you have to correct <laughs> them all. And we're all going to get a little smarter today. Number five is compression is separate from angle of view. There is this myth mythical trait of compression, which people attribute to medium format cameras. Every time we test like a medium format camera versus a full frame camera or full frame versus APS-C, we'll say, okay, if you use equivalent settings, the pictures are indistinguishable. There's always somebody who speaks up and says, oh, but what about compression? What about that medium format compression? And I have tested this over and over again. I've researched it, and compression is entirely part of angle of view. And angle of view is just equivalent focal length. That's how photographers typically measure angle of view. So if you're at an equivalent of 85 millimeters, whether the sensor is APS-C or full frame or medium format, the images are indistinguishable. There is no extra magical trait of compression. This just seems to be rooted in medium format marketing material. I think medium format camera makers sort of perpetuate this myth of medium format having like magical traits like of compression. And it's always something subjective that can't be measured. And then people learn this from the marketing material and people who buy the cameras obviously believe it. And so they try to reinforce it and the myth kind of perpetuates. But I can't produce any evidence that shows any trace of this. We Somebody do, does have evidence, evidence. I'd love to see it. We should do another blind test like we did with the color because people also had this preconceived notion that Canon or Nikon had the best color. But when we did a blind test and let people choose their favorite, they chose Sony, which everyone thought had the worst color. And maybe this is a, a similar phenomenon where people have agreed on something just based on a feeling, but not really truth. And you could show medium format pictures and, you know, other sensors and see what people like the best. Yeah, you're right. We've done testing internally, but it is good to actually involve other people. Other people. Let's bring in the folks. Coming up, is is JPEG better? Than RAW? Than RAW? Whew. Look out, Jared. <laughs> About to get a little scary, and F A isn't F eight isn't sweet. I know yeah. everybody always says F eight is the sweet point. Is that true? What the heck does that mean? Maybe not. But first, <laughs> let's talk about something that is sweet. Our sponsor, Squarespace. Why? Number one, they make this podcast 
possible so that you're learning with your ears and your eyes for free. Number two, they make you look like a professional and they make look, you look like you have good taste and style even if you don't because their templates <laughs> are professionally designed and they look clean and simple and beautiful. Tony, you know that's true. I have no sense for design or style or matching colors or anything, but I can just go into Squarespace and pick one of their templates and then I can just focus on making pictures. I just drop my pictures into their great looking template because they have pro designers. So I don't have to worry about hiring them because they've done it. You're I not can alone. still customize it. You're not alone because we used to review portfolios and the backgrounds would be, oh, bonkers. <laughs> so thank you, Squarespace, for making people more stylish. And guess what? You can get a free trial for 14 days, no credit card needed. If you go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea, you try it for the 14 days. It just goes away. You don't have to remember to cancel, but you're going to want it. You're going to say, my pictures look so good, and you're going to want to go use the coupon code CHELSEA to get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. That's Chelsea with an S-E-A, the correct way to spell it. <laughs> okay. Right? Do we need to make a separate video about this? You're getting pretty fired and up. No one's going to be mad in our audience because they're all men and none of them are named Chelsea. Number six, raw processing is better. And this isn't really necessarily a, a raw versus JPEG debate, but this is about a very specific problem that JPEG files had when they were relatively new. Yeah, so to be clear, we have an entire video discussing the benefits of shooting raw files over JPEG files. Yeah. Raw files capture highlights and shadows that are lost if you set your camera to process that raw data into a JPEG in camera. Not debating that at all. Yeah, this is about image quality. In the early days of digital photography, cameras often only shot JPEG. And then eventually they started allowing you to save the raw data. And then Adobe Lightroom came out and the Adobe Lightroom could take that raw data and process it into a JPEG. And my experience at that time using Lightroom version one was that when Lightroom processed the raw files, it looked so much better than the JPEG that the cameras produced. And I think this is what started the idea that even if you aren't recovering highlights and shadows, the raw file will always look better. And it was definitely true at the time. Often in camera JPEGs, the color was really bad. Cameras often applied like way too much sharpening to try to make stuff look better than it actually was. Yeah. Or the contrast would be like way too high and it would just produce garbage. But nowadays I find the in camera JPEG processing to look great. Yeah, it applies contrast that usually makes the colors a little bit better. You've probably experienced this if you're editing in Lightroom and you like the picture you see and then you click on it and it goes like flat, like the colors get washed out and it removes those JPEG edits that were kind of baked in. Um, so the image quality looks the same, the JPEG versus RAW. You're not going to lose sharpness, right? Yeah, honestly, I often like the initial the like in-camera JPEG better than Adobe's default processing of the raw file. Yeah. Often when I take a raw file, I then have to go into the develop module and select a different profile to get the colors because I do see that switch where the preview looks better than actually Adobe's processing of the raw file. I use my own presets anyway, so it doesn't matter to me. Boom. <laughs> Roasted. Let's go to number seven. You can't edit JPEGs. Where'd this one start? Back in the olden days, people would Ooh. open up Photoshop. They would, we, again, we only had JPEG, really. You would edit the photo in Photoshop, and then you would save it. And then you would go back later, you would edit it again, and you would resave it. And this sort of continual resaving of JPEG files would cause like layer upon layer of JPEG artifacts. Where, because JPEG compresses the file and loses stuff. And so as you made these kind of continual uh, adjustments, if you were to compare it to the original picture, you would see like it had become mushy and you would have all these like blocks in the sky and that kind of thing. And this started the idea that you can't edit JPEG files. At that time, what you would do is you would instead save it as a TIFF file or something that wasn't compressed losslessly. But the myth has kind of persisted to the point where a lot of people absolutely won't even try to edit JPEG files. If they intend to edit, then they would only shoot raw and not shoot JPEG. I think that the myth has evolved as well because you can edit JPEGs, but um, they don't have the same capabilities as editing a raw file. But that's kind of extreme editing, like really raising the shadows or really bringing down the highlights. So 
raw is capable of more extreme editing, but if you need to just go in and do some basic stuff, then you can definitely edit a JPEG and retain the image quality. Yeah, so if you had your camera set to JPEG, it's not like your pictures are lost. You can do no editing. You can fix the white balance. You can clone things out. You can adjust the contrast. You can even actually recover shadows and highlights quite a bit. A bit. Yeah. Not as much as raw files, but you can still do a lot. Number eight, turn off image stabilization on a tripod. This is true and false. I don't actually know this one because I know sometimes I have to do this. Yeah, it nowadays it used to be image stabilization was so dumb that every time you put the camera on a tripod, you had to turn it off. And if you didn't turn it off, it would be ruined. This is still the case sometimes. If you use a third-party lens, like a Sigma or Tamron lens, they are not smart enough to detect that it's on a tripod and shut off. But nowadays, most of the time, with like major cameras, Sony, Canon, Nikon, and their name brand lenses made by that same manufacturer, you can put it on a tripod and you will get exactly the same image quality as if you turned it off. This one's confusing. Sometimes it's true. Yes, I bring it up because we often will test things on a tripod and I will almost always do it the same test with the image stabilization on and off. And so I can see that there is no perceptible difference, even like scrutinizing things very closely under controlled laboratory conditions. But I always get comments saying, well, this picture looks not sharp. You clearly forgot to turn the image stabilization off. And so I wanted to make the point that most of the time, if you're using like name brand stuff, it doesn't make any difference. And if you forgot to turn it off, it's not that big of a deal or it's probably not a deal at all. But again, probably not third party gear. You definitely have to do it or you will ruin a shot. Myth number nine, lenses are sharpest at F8. The sweet spot, right? So many people, when they want the ultimate in sharpness, they set their lens to F8. But again, we're testing things all the time, and I'm often trying to produce the sharpest image possible for some sort of lens test. And I will go through like every F-stop and then pick the one that's the sharpest. And it's almost never F8 especially if you're using professional like gear, then the sweet spot will be much, much lower. The sweet spot is often F4. Sometimes it's F5, 6. It's almost never F8. It's only really with lower end consumer gear, like kit lenses, uh, like the Tamron 150 to 600. If you stop it down to F8, it will definitely get a little bit sharper. But for the most part, the sweet spot is much closer to wide open than you might think. How are these people going to find this out, Tony? Are they just going to be taking pictures of test charts, finding their sweet spot? You definitely can do that. You can also look up a video I have titled How to Use DxO Mark. And there I show you how to look at DxO Mark's data to find out where they found the most detail in their sort of objective testing. So that, that can allow you to find the data in just a couple of minutes. We're getting so or just test it yourself. We're getting real deep into Nerdsville, and I'm, I'm getting scared. Number 10, manual focus is more accurate. Who said this? I don't... People say this all the time, and it is rooted in some truth. Again, in the early era of autofocus, autofocus was pre pretty bad. <laughs> and when the first consumer autofocus cameras came out in the late 70s and early 80s, technically they could autofocus, but they were just missing focus all the time. And so serious professionals continued to use manual focus. And I think that's the origin of this urban legend. Like it was true back then. But modern autofocus systems, definitely more accurate in all conditions than manual focusing. Again, spoken as somebody who does these sort of tests where I'm trying to extract the maximum sharpness, I will do every type of autofocus for a given camera and then also manually focus. And I stopped even trying to manually focus because 100% of the time, my efforts at manually focusing were less sharp you're than inferior. autofocus. Your hand-eye coordination is inferior <laughs> and you're not a real photographer. Can I also say that people's idea of what is sharp and in focus is different, even if people are really experienced, because we had some um, focusing issues, and there are a bunch of professional photographers around going through photos, and they're like, wait, this one's sharp. And then someone would be like, that's not sharp. And they'd be like, hmm, maybe it's not sharp. And I was <laughs> sitting there thinking, wow, this is kind of interesting. Nobody can agree on what's sharp. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, If you look at older pictures where the photographer only had manual focus camera, like a lot of the most famous pictures of all time, if you really look at them, a lot of them are just straight up out of focus. 
I like when people make the argument where they're like, Cartier Bresson didn't need to be sharp to be famous. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. Cool. Okay, number 11, Canon has the best color science. We talked about this one a little bit. Yeah. We did a, a poll with um, like 1,300 people, I think, and it was a blind test where I showed them pictures taken with different cameras, but I didn't identify which, which picture was taken with which camera, and people like Sony the best. Number two was Fuji, number three was Canon, and number four was Nikon. But we also found out that if you do shoot RAW files instead of JPEG files, then there was literally no distinguishable difference. If you processed everything in Lightroom, the pictures were then indistinguishable. Because that is, after all, the point of a RAW file. Is and the point of RAW processing yeah. is to make everything just look the same. And that, that worked. Nobody could tell the difference. We should do another test where we show the different brands and then we show a photo that we just tweaked to what we think looks nice mm -hmm. and see if people just prefer the photo once it's edited anyway. Well, I don't know. I never leave a photo alone. I, that's just not fun to me. Yeah, if you do any editing on the color, then color science is absolutely meaningless. It just yeah. completely erases it. Um, it also seems to only be a measurement of white balance. There was no... Dis if I just use the JPEGs, but set each one to auto white balance in Lightroom, nobody, again, could distinguish it. So color science is is only relevant when shooting JPEGs and when using auto white balance and then not being willing to edit the color at all. Otherwise, color science is meaningless. Yeah, why do people argue about that? It's still such a big deal to people. Number 12, memory card failures. Cheap or user error? I feel like everything's user error. I'm being sarcastic. Every time something goes wrong, people just say it's your fault. Yeah, this is it does seem to be a thing in photography. Ca the cameras are so perfect that if anything goes wrong, clearly it was the photographer's fault. But in their defense, I mess up a lot of things in life. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we polled 4,500 people to find out what their experiences were with memory cards and. Across the board, the biggest trend I found is that the more pictures you took, the more likely it was that you had a card failure. And people who took less than 10,000 pictures, uh, about a third of them had had a memory card failure. But by the time people had taken over a million photos, like long-term professional photographers, more than 75% of them had had a card failure. It didn't matter whether the person was... Uh, noob or very skilled and studied things. It didn't matter really what brand of card that they use or what type of card that they use. The most important thing was just how long had they been shooting. And it shows that it's not a matter of user error. We really didn't see that you were using a cheap card made any measurable difference whatsoever. This cards happens. just fail. It just, just, it just happens. happens. Stuff breaks, right? Stuff just breaks. We it's that simple. We mean to each other about it. <laughs> yeah. Stuff breaks, man. My stove just broke. It's not because I'm a horrible cook. I am, but that's not why I broke. <laughs> there are a couple other urban legends that I need to research more, but I wanted to get people's help with them. And one is this Ooh. idea of micro contrast. I hear about it all the time. People, we review a lens and they're like, but how's the micro contrast? We'll have talked about the sharpness. And I've asked this before. I want to see pictures taken with a lens that has good sharpness, but poor micro contrast. And I want to see the same picture taken with a lens that has uh, good micro contrast, but poor sharpness. And I want to see them side by side, the same image. And then so I can try to distinguish the difference between these terms, because to me, micro contrast is just the same as sharpness. But everybody's trying to distinguish the two and act like it's, again, some mythical property of the lens that we haven't discussed. And then the other term that comes up is the 3D pop. You hear this term, people are like, but what about the 3D pop? Or we'll review some lens and it doesn't seem to perform well, and they'll be like, yeah, but it has the 3D pop. I what is talk, that? I don't talk exactly. to people that say that. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love to see examples of what exactly 3D pop is and how it is different from just contrast and bokeh or the amount of background blur. Or is it just some mythical term that people made up? 3D pop sounds like a VR concert or something. Yeah, actually. It sounds really that. fun. Thank you, Squarespace, again, for making our podcast possible. And you can make your dreams possible 
by making them a reality and putting them down on a website and showing your best photos first. Not in chronological order. You get to control exactly what your client sees while looking professional. And you can try it for free for 14 days. You can go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea and use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. And once again, if you're enjoying this podcast or you've been listening to it for a while and you can't wait for a new episode to come out, you can help us out by reviewing it. And if we read every single review, so thank you to all of you that write such kind reviews about the podcast. And if you'd like to suggest a future episode idea, you can do that right in your review and we'll be reading them and seeing them and thinking about it. So yeah. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'd love to hear your feedback in a comment. I'd love to see you disagree with me politely. Of you course. see that? People get really emotional, but we can be objective about these things. Mm-hmm. We're trying to be scientists. I'd also love to think, I'd love to hear what you think the biggest urban legend is. What did we not bring up? What falsehood do people continue to perpetuate? And where did that urban legend begin? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, and thank you, Squarespace. See you guys next week. <laughs>